you have to get micro commitments from them. That's why the self-directed IRA moving to that Roach Motel concept is so freaking important. Welcome. You're listening to the Apartment Investing Show. This is where you'll learn how to start or scale your apartment investing career. Your host, Adam Adams, believes in personal development, physically, financially, and mentally. Adam and his guests will show you how to create residual income by investing in apartment communities. Now, here's your host, Adam AAA Adams. Welcome back to the Creative Real Estate Podcast. I am your host, as always, Adam A. Adams, and I'm thrilled, seriously thrilled to have Sal Buscemi on the mic today because last year... We had the first annual Raising Money Summit, and Sal comes on stage, and I will just share with you one quick thing. We had tons of fantastic, amazing, famous speakers on the stage, and I'm not knocking a single one, but what I will say is the feedback that I got after Sal presented was like, that was the best presentation. And he was talking about calling the capital. I've been wanting to have him on the show for a while, for quite a while. And finally, we made it happen. So we're going to be talking about how to call the capital. It's a six-step blueprint for you to be able to follow if you want to ask investors to put their money into your deal. This is going to benefit you a lot. Sal, will you give us a little bit about, about your background and how it relates to the topic? Yeah, I think it's important to talk about this. Um, my background is, is that I started after college. Uh, I went to college in New York City from New York, and I worked at a, an investment bank called Goldman Sachs in New York. And that's where I learned the business was really from the best and brightest. My ex-boss actually headed the department. His name is Steve Mnuchin, and he was a distressed debt divester. So I, he tra- I learned from the best, and now he's treasury secretary. So you can't look on the news and not see you know, his face or, or anything like that. Um, after that, we did a lot of distressed real estate. At 29, I raised $30 million from a hedge fund in New York, and we were basically the kitchen sink for Bear Stearns. And then 2012, we bought a special servicing company for a dollar, recapitalized that with $15 million. And we were doing a bunch of Dutch auction techniques, if you will, buying investors who invested in these um, hard money loans who didn't know what they were doing. And the Part of it is, is that everybody thought that there was a lot of fraud. There wasn't a lot of fraud. There was just a lot of inexperience. So we were moving forward and I said, you know what? We were raising money from other areas and we started to put together the systems of how we call this money. Right now we're making a $3.5 million investment into a, forgive me if you don't understand this, maybe I can send you a blueprint later, uh, Adam, if you remind me, um, into a $250 million asset under management mezzanine lender. Because one of the things I love in distressed commercial real estate is defaulted MES pieces. If they're written correctly, depending on the intercredited agreement, you can just walk in and take over the loan subject to, similar to what you guys would do um, when you are doing any sort of subject to in residential real estate. And after that, we raised about $19 million. So once we're moving forward, we do a lot of things in real estate. We do a lot of alternatives. My investors are single family and multifamily offices that I've known for well over 20, for about 20 years right now, since the days I grew up at Goldman Sachs. And what we do is we're very special because we create the investment bespoke or customized to what their needs are. And I think a lot of times people are out there, they're like, I got a deal. And they're trying to put it out to their investors. I think you need to figure out what the investors want. So we've done some pretty interesting things that might be kinky by your standpoint, such as fine art lending uh, with the guy who invented the Discover card. But we're using these strategies now as we're building assets under management for this fund that we bought uh, the GP interest into. And um, so this is part of how we call the capital. And this is how I train my staff to do all of this. And if it's good for me, it's probably better for you because I think a lot of people have a hard time calling the capital, especially people who might feel as though that they, you know, that, that they're on the wrong side of the table. So we're going to show you how to turn the side around, uh, the tables around, so that it's actually to your benefit. And these hacks work. I, I don't guarantee anything in life, Adam, uh, but I'll give you the AAA guarantee here, no pun intended, <laughs> that, if, if, that if you use this strategy, you will be able to close deals much faster than ever before. All right. Is that cool? That is I'm very cool. you let me on. I mean, nobody likes to have me talk. I thought, you know, I was like <laughs> Debbie Downer and everything, you know, it's uh, asking all the hard questions on Facebook about their deals. But I'm, I'm privileged and, and proud to be here. And I love what you're doing. I support everything you do. 
Um, and I'd love to have you back on our podcast once that's up too, talking about that stuff. Um, but in the meantime, let's get the business. This New Yorker has some wood to chop. Is that all right with you? Let's do it. All right. So let's talk about certain things here. I think when people are looking at raising capital, you're looking at it just as far as real estate is concerned. If you know how to raise capital for real estate, you can raise capital for venture, special opportunities, which we'll get into in a moment, um, venture stuff. You can raise money around anything, but you have to make sure that you're actually talking to your investors and you're managing their expectations around it. So one of the things we like to do is that whenever we talk to an investor, I like to ask them, what's your experience in real estate? And if they say, well, I don't have any, I'm like, ooh, (laughs) I get a little, you know, because now you have to deal with the guy, you know, let me talk to my financial advisor. Um, He says you're a fraud. There's no such thing as a self-directed IRA. We've all heard this before, which is absolute hogwash. I'm actually coming out with a book called The $100 Million IRA. And there's a picture of Mitt Romney on it because when he was running for office in 2012, he had an IRA worth $100 million. I can tell you, I know a lot of people who have IRAs in eight figures. It's legal. So the first thing I'm doing when I'm talking to an investor and they're new and they want to get to know me, I would say, hey, pick your SDIRA custodian and say, well, we uh, work a lot with what we call ERISA plans or self-directed IRAs. Do you have a self-directed IRA? They're going to lie and say they do. They don't. They really don't in the, in the standpoint that you and I would want that. They're like, well, yeah, it's that fidelity and I get to pick the sushi menu each month and, you know, mutual funds. You want to work with someone, a custodian that'll actually take that money and put it into a self-directed account. Now, these companies don't like to move fees away. I'm going through this right now with my mom's account and her trust and things. And they, you have to fax everything and it takes a while. What you do is you call up these guys. I like using uh, Vantage. I like using Sprout and say, hey, let me talk to one of your business development guys. I have a bunch of doctors, say, who are interested in investing in this stuff. Can I set up a concierge for them? And they'll say, yes, have them call me. They'll be welcome to take on new accounts. That's all they do. And I would say, okay, you're going to have responsibility to make sure this guy has all of his 50 million pesky stupid questions answered but I want to make sure that that money moves into the self-directed IRA, okay? Now, there's another way to do this too. If you don't want to do it, you can always print out the forms and and send it by priority mail. And then that gives you another excuse for the investor to reach out for you or for you to reach out to the investor because you took time and resources to print stuff stuff up and send it out. Now, I usually have an intern do that stuff or I just hire one of my uh, employees' kids to do that stuff. It's very easy to do. You don't have to do it yourself, but they feel obligated because they need to reply to the phone call because you sent them something to help them. And it's all on them. It's critical. If you send it in an envelope, it's going to get open. The priority mail, I think, is about six bucks right now. I don't even know. But it does give them a sense of urgency and follow-up. I will tell you, though, any money that you get in... Now, I've managed hundreds of millions of dollars over almost 20 years. And I will tell you that once that money, and I've never seen this happen before in my life, goes into a self-directed IRA, that is the Roach Motel. Because now what's happening is that people are going to be beholden to you, Adam, to find them deals, right? Because they're like, I'm sitting on all this money. I understand the rate just, the Fed just cut rates today. Oh my gosh, what am I doing? Adam, what's going on? I thought you had a deal. I thought you had a deal. Are you a real deal? What's going on? That money ain't never going back to Fidelity or wherever it came from. But it's going to be up to you to exercise patience or what we call discretion and not just to blow it on the first deal that comes along. You reframe, what you've done here is that you've actually reframed the relationship because you've given them a service, time, advisory. They're very motivated. They're very interested. And then this way, you, all you have to do is just put them into these IRAs. And before you know it, we call this the private bank concept. Before you know it, you have a million here. You have you know, 150,000 here, you have something here, you have something there, and now you're off to the races. So when the time comes, you're like, all right, you know what to do. And then that's when we get into the next steps of what we talk about. When you first talk to a new investor, um, when I talk to large family offices, and I think that needs to be defined in the context of this conversation, anyone uh, with assets under management over a hundred million dollars, it costs 1% per year to manage these things. Uh, 100 million is slumming it. Anything less than that, they're just a rich guy, you know, or earned income, or maybe someone like a, you know, a football player. But when I talk to these people, the last thing I want to do is to pitch them anything. I want to get to know them. And what they do is I just ask them a question. And with family offices, this is tell me about your family story and then just shut up and enjoy the beer and coffee because there's no one more 
interested in that story than the guy telling it. And now you're creating a bond. The last thing you want to do is to really show up with four pounds of paper to sit in front of them. You're looking for really marriage on the first date. And if you do get marriage on the first date, is that someone who you really want to spend the, the rest of your life with? So people are very trusting, but you have to make sure that you allow them. Don't push them at this point yet, okay? You got to make sure that you're treating your investors like personal friends. I always send them all sorts of like, I know one person's in the Van Halen, so am I. So anytime I see something, I know I send it to him and, you know, he likes it. You know, we send text messages. We send them articles. I just wrote a letter yesterday. It was released yesterday for our non-real estate related stuff. Letters sell, okay? Letters sell more than any pitch book. And if you want a copy of that, Adam, I'll put it up there on your site for people to look at that. You know, send them. What I like doing is once I close a deal with them, what I like to do is I like to send them deal toys. There is nothing more important for your marketing than sending your investors deal toys. I'm getting a little ahead of myself right now. We're going to get through the steps. But one of the things I like to do is I like to show them something because once that deal toy sits on their desk, people are going to ask questions. Oh, that's nice. Where did you get that from? Oh, that's cool. How can I be a part of that? So you're elevating the status of your investors, especially doctors and dentists. Case in point, we're doing a deal right now with a fine art lending fund with the person who I've known for years who invented the Discover card. He's got his own family office. Office, and he does fine art lending. So we're clubbing in with him on that with a few families. And what I'm giving is an acrylic little model of the Louvre in Paris with the deal on it, you know, and I would suggest even a multifamily, just a little thing that says total deal size, you know, blue spruce investments, you know, that you don't have to personalize it, but it allows them to see and be reminded of it. It gives them status and that in turn wants them to invest more with you. That's very, very important. So let's get into some things here as it relates to how to call the capital, all right? Um, what I like to do is I like to talk to people and I like to start decorating things. Always have enough lead time on your deals. Don't do any short fuse deals. I would say give yourself at least 30 days. I mean, that's tight from you know first gentle touch to really going through and closing the deal. And the first thing I like to do is I like to uh, shoot a video and video professionals, if you really have conviction in your deal and you've already got it under contract and everything, you owe it to yourself to find someone on 99designs or someone with a drone who can walk, who you can walk through the property with and they can actually see and internalize it because the pictures don't really do difference. People just assume pictures are a lie and everything's doctored today. But the video is real raw, it's you, it's talking about why you're passionate about it, the inflection in your voice. You will get more investors with one video. You'll get them interested than you would if you were to send them just a PDF and throwing them onto a webinar. The video should be less than three minutes long if you can, but it's just enough as a teaser for people to see this. Have it professionally done. It'll cost you $500 on 99designs.com, okay? Very easy. So once we have that, now we send out the video and say, okay, here's the video. Here's the tear sheet that we've put together. This details everything you need to know about the terms of the deal. You want to hyperlink all the important stuff. Nobody wants to look at Excel spreadsheets or any of that stuff. They never look at it. Guys like I do, but other guys, people who are your investors, mostly who are retail guys, they don't care. They want to hear the story. They don't want to see the numbers. A lot of people, if you were to ask them on Facebook about the deal that do this for homework. Next time you hear someone humble bragging about writing a check to an LP uh, in a deal, ask them about the numbers of their deal. They won't know anything about it. They won't. And it'll probably cause some sort of like spirited discussion. But anyway, people care about the story. This is you. I've been doing this for a while. This is great. This is what's going to be feeding my family. This is a great deal. It's in a great area here. These people can do make magic for cheap. If not, just find a local intern at a college that does audio and video animation and that type of work. People can do that very, very, very cheaply today. There's no excuse for it, okay? So step one to call in the capital. Let's just go through this real quick. You're going to do a video. You're going to send it out to everybody. And then you're going to send out a tear sheet. And say, okay, we're ready. That tear sheet is going to have what we call deadlines on it. And what you do is you're going to set up the deadlines so that people are forced to respond. Um, negotiation trick, I guess you could start to see this. And one of the oldest negotiation books talks about um, how the owner of Holiday Inn before it became the biggest franchise that it is today had problems kicking uh, people out. And so they said, everybody will be kicked out by noon the next day, or that's the checkout day. You have to make sure that you bold and highlight those terms. Now, how do you do that to keep your deal from not getting stale? 
Well, you tranche it out and that's exactly what you're going to do. So when you tranche it out, you're going to say, hey, you know what? First guys, they get the equity kickers, they get the income kickers, maybe they get, you know, whatever you're offering, a pref or maybe, a, you know, if it's a fun sidecar rights or anything like that. But the first investors get the whole enchilada. Okay. And then you say, okay, well, tranche one is closing in a week. Tranche one's closing in three days. Tranche one's closing in two days. Last call, tranche here. And what you're doing is, is that you're sending this all out to them in an email with the documents that have already been put together with the tear sheet on top of the PPM and all the other know your investor and all those docs. And it's all on right signature. So what you're doing is that you're removing the friction from that point because I can't trust people to their own devices sometimes. Like somebody I know who's an older investor still probably has and Hewlett Packard, flatbed scanner, no feeder, inkjet printer, he's not going to know how to put it. It's going to be, it's, there's friction there. And when you're able to do it in such a way with right signature, it's really good from a compliance standpoint. But the other standpoint is, is that people can just go to their smartphones and it's really just, you know, they can fill in everything right here. Like, oh, it just, it takes two seconds. Tell them in the email, it takes two seconds, fill it out. First page, wiring instructions. Second page, Dear investor, thank you for joining us with this. Wiring instructions again. Third page, tear sheet to remind them of the investment. And then the rest of it is just the legal docs. That's it. Okay, so tranche one. Tranche two, probably pull away some things. Hey, this is great. We got this. At a, this is a great value added deal. Tell them exactly two seconds. People need to be told what to do. You cannot allow your investors to be left to their own devices, especially newer ones. If you're dealing with institutions, that's fine. If you're dealing with mom and pop investors, you have to do a lot of this for them. And that'll probably be getting on the phone with the uh, IRA custodian too as well. So this is all in within step one, right? That's correct, yes. You're putting together the tear sheet, you're putting together the docs, you're ready to take the money. You're setting up deadlines. You are, you know, you're giving them the best terms. You've laid everything out and you're ready to send this email out right now. And what that looks like is that it's actually gonna be coming from right signature because your investors have already you know, heard about the deal, now they just wanna get into it. As a courtesy, when we prepare the documents, we always put the tear sheet in there, we always put the wiring instructions at least twice, now we're gonna do it three times. So step one is document preparation. Please, please hire someone on Upwork.com to do a good graphic design on this. It'll cost you 15 bucks to clean it up. If you are born before, the, before 1980, you have no right doing PowerPoints yourself unless you've done it for a living. So please, people will judge you on the perception or the appearance of what your uh, tear sheet looks like. You don't have to do a whole deck, just a tear sheet. And in that tear sheet, we're still in step one. You have to make sure that you hyperlink all the models and hyperlink everything. Then that way it looks nice and neat and it doesn't look like a big you know, football field Excel spreadsheet that would just bore investors. They want to hear the story and that's part of it. So we're teeing up the thing right now. Step one, put everything together, put the documents together. That's where we're going. Are we clear on that? Absolutely. Are we ready for step two? Yes. Step two is, is that we're going to start calling the capital. All right. So what we do this is we start doing this by breaking out tranches, broken out. Usually I would say in two week increments. So this is why you need a little more lead time. So tranche one investors, as we stated, get everything. They get the income kickers, they get the pref, they get whatever you offer them. Tranche two investors, they're more like, you know, second class citizens at this point. So they didn't get in and they're, you know, probably just going to get income. Maybe, you know, they're not going to get an income kicker. They're not going to get a preferred. They're just lucky to be there. Maybe you make them common, whatever the story is, you guys know what you're doing. So like maybe like a, a for an example of this, if I may, of like what, you know, a first tranche would look like, it would be, you probably give them, you know, maybe two weeks to make the call. You pay them like maybe like a 6% pref quarterly, 70% to the investors, 30 to you. Zero management fee, right? Because, but I'm going to get back to that in a second. Peripesu, my money is like yours, or even Steven, and equity kickers. Okay, perfect. Now that's great. So now we have all the money coming in. That's step two. We have money coming in for tranche one. Okay, so the steps are going to be a little different here moving forward. Step two is you got to say, okay, well, there's a lot more money out there. What do I do to keep the deal from going stale? That's what I hate seeing as the deal's going stale. And what you do is 
you just do a second tranche. And so the second tranche, an example of that might be, okay, we're going to time that out like maybe another like, you know, 15 to 30 days, depending on how much time you have, of course. And that has no pref. It's 50% to investors. They're paying a 2% management fee. They're not peri pursu, and they get reduced equity kickers when sold or refinanced. And again, these are just examples of terms and you can do a lot more with this based off of your creative structuring of, of how we do this. And then the third tranche, when you're coming down to the end, remember, you always want to make sure that your investors are always front and loaded. So a th maybe a third tranche would be that they just get a cash flow note, which is basically worthless, 2% management fee and equity kickers. Now, this is very powerful because what's going to happen is, is that you're going to have to use discretion because somebody's always going to come up with an excuse and say, well, I want to be in tranche one. I've been on all your deals before. Why am I not in tranche one? Well, here's the dirty, filthy secret. Do you want to hear this? I want to hear this. What's Blue Spruce Boardroom? It's Adam Adams' private inner circle program that helps serious investors take their businesses to the next level. With 24-7 access to our private Facebook community, exclusive mastermind retreats held at luxurious resorts around the country, bi-weekly coaching calls, education, support, and monthly meetings, this is the full immersion you need in order to get from where you are to where you want to be in your real estate business. When you join Blue Spruce Boardroom, you'll become close with Adam and the other members of this exclusive inner circle. You'll meet accredited investors, deal sponsors, high net worth key principals, as well as real estate influencers. The perfect combination for you to take your business to the next level. Apply today by following the link in the show notes. Okay, you treat all your investors the same. They all get tranche one. You're just playing with them a little bit because what's going to happen is, is that it's going to force them to pay attention and you're, out bound, you're outlining the boundaries of the relationship. To really paper this deal, to really do that would probably cost an extra twenty-five dollars to $35,000 to do it. But if you're just giving the same one, they're like, wait, how come I'm, I wasn't supposed to get tranche one? I was supposed to be in tranche two. Oh, well, you got the wrong docs. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> you're a lot, you know, my loss, you're bad. And people really like that because now they feel as though that they're winning. Okay. So we went through that. So now we're in what step are we at right now? I just, we just finished step we're gonna, three. We're going to be in step four. Okay. Go ahead. So now we're at step four and now we're actually going to make phone calls and texts. Okay. We have a lot of problem with people not paying attention to emails today. Email deliverability is very, very poor. So what we've done is we've actually put everybody's, we've put everybody's cell phone number into a Google text app and you can actually text from your computer. Hey, it's Adam. I just want to let you know we have a deadline coming. Please check your email. Please check your email. You know, keep going back to them texting them. You can send them in groups. You want to send them so it's more personal, so it doesn't come across as like a political fundraiser. You want to get on the phone with them. Some are going to have questions. You're going to have to, I, we have a staff that does that, which is great. I don't get on the phone, um, but this is for you, for your edification, because you have to understand what your investors want. What are they scared of? What aren't they? And really what you're going to find out with them is that they're scared of what they don't know. They're going to make up all sorts of BS like, oh, illiquidity or things like that. This is where you're going to handle a lot of those objections. And that's why it's like, well, it's a liquid for five years. I know, but when was the last time a very wealthy person really cared about illiquidity in real estate, right? I mean, I know the family that owns the Pan Am building free and clear. Do you think they care about liquidity? No, that's just a function of a stockbroker making up an ability to charge fees off of emotions. So are you ready to grow, grow up and be with the grown up men and women yet? Enjoy Adam, or are you going to sit there and just watch everybody else get ahead? Oh, no, no, I'm going to put the money in. So it's, this is where the persuasion comes in and all this. And maybe you can give them things like, look, we have one spot right now. Some guy uh, nagged up on his $100,000 allocation in Trunch One. I can give that to you if you want. You know, come, do you want to come in? Yes, I need it by Friday. Can you tell me you can get it by Friday? Yes, yeah. Look, investor, I'm used to working with very wealthy investors who are used to getting what they want. I can't wait for you on this. I'm trusting you to make sure that you can close this by Friday. Is that correct? Say yes. 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 You know, and you do that. You have to get micro commitments from them. That's why the self-directed IRA moving to that Roach Motel concept is so freaking important. Does that make sense? It's making a lot of sense. Thank All you. Right. Perfect. I know I'm a little flustered today. We have a lot going on here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, uh, when you're setting up, when you're, when you're calling the capital before you, you know, do that, I forgot to talk about this, but of course, um, you want to make sure you set up your LLC, put the money into, and that's going to be very important. We use uh, Wells Fargo. <laughs> I mean, this is probably something I shouldn't be talking about, but uh, they are very easy to work with for investors, especially new investors who are setting up real estate holding companies. That's the code word you want to use with the 
you know, the person that makes $45,000 a year setting up a uh, business checking account for you. Oh, it's just a real estate investment company. And then you can set up your entity. You can do all sorts of stuff with that. And then the money just comes in and it's great. Um, and then you just wire it out. Okay. The other thing too, that I want to make sure that we talk about is the getting into the next steps, which is after the closing. Is that okay? Please. Perfect. So step five, you just had sex. You're happy. You have to start thanking people. And this is what I talk about. You have to send a thank you email to everybody. All the email, everybody who you've solicited as an investor, anyone who's a current investor in the deal, anyone who's an investor in the other deal, you have to send, <laughs> you have to send out an email saying, we just closed this wonderful deal. Here's a tombstone of it. It's a $13 million deal and somewhere, wherever. We like the deal because of this. The story was this. Our investors are making this and our investors are getting an increase in net worth like this. And if you want to see like a, an example of that, Adam, I'd be more than happy to show you how we've done that with one of our deals. They don't care about IRRs. Nobody gives a crap about it. Nobody who you're showing your deals to cares about IRRs. They care about cash flow. They care about cash on cash return. A pension fund told me a long time ago, Sal, my pensioners can't eat IRRs. And you know what? You can't bring an IRR to your Mercedes dealership either, okay? What I want to do, when you send that letter out, be a little self-aggrandizing. Say, this is great. It took a lot of time, but we were able to get it at a price that we are very happy about. After that, you're going to start setting up bookkeeping. There's a lot of, uh, don't do this yourself, but there's a lot of virtual bookkeepers. I like using Fully Accountable. They're very cheap, but what they do is they send the ACHs out every quarter to all of our investors, and it only costs you per each individual entity. I'm not sure, but I know the owner. He's a good friend. His name's Vinny Fisher, but if you go to Fully Accountable, they should be doing all of this stuff for you. And then this way, you don't have to worry about writing checks. You don't have to worry about football season, doing K-1s or any of that stuff. I mean, it is like we are really being on this. And you have to make sure that you are actually evangelizing this deal all over social media. Don't ask for capital. Just say, this is a great deal. Look at what I did. LinkedIn, this is what we did. This is what we did. This is what we did. That's the most important part. Does that make sense? I want a little bit more clarification. So sure. you, you we're talking about sharing that you have a good deal, but it, it seems like a precursor to asking for money. I just wanted to clarify that with you right now. It is. So when you're talking about something you've done, people like to follow success. And what you're doing is, is that you're continuing the market to all the investors, especially those who are probably what we call investing for free. Maybe they're like, well, I'm going to see what Adam does with this first. And if he doesn't screw it up, then I'll go in on the next one. That's what I'm talking about. Is, Got that, it. is that clear? Absolutely. And okay. most of the investors are those, most of the investors that I've met mm -hmm. in the last few years are those free investors. They, they seem to skip people's very first deal and, and say, let's see what happens here. I, I like Adam. I like whoever, but let's just see how this deal goes. And I want to be in the second one. Do you have any way, since we're on the topic, yeah. uh, for, for somebody who's new and getting their very first deal, mm -hmm. I've done seven syndications. Now I'm, I'm about to close my eighth. So mm -hmm. it's much, much easier. Just the second one was at least a hundred times easier than the first. Right. Do you have any feedback or, or help for that person who's going to syndicate and close on their very first one? Yeah, I would. I say, I mean, as far as using the post-closing steps or just getting some, what, what do you mean? Any, any advice just since we're on the topic? Yeah, I would. Here's what I would do. So if you're talking to investors, investors want to know what you're thinking. And one of the things I like to do is I read zero hedge and I'll just come out and I'll say something that'll make your coffee spit out, right? Like, and, and this has been something that I've been doing for a while. And because I'm a finance geek, if you ask me about football, I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about sports, but I always say, well, you know, Adam, I don't think there's any incentive or catalyst for race to increase in your lifetime or mine. And at that point, now you're starting a, you know, a conversation and now it's, you're talking to them about the beliefs that you have in the market. And that's why you're going into real estate because you're seeing very good opportunities in real estate. Um, rates will always be low, but now we're coming into a time maybe where there could be a lot more opportunity. Don't say what it is, but just say we're seeing a lot of opportunity. And by the way, we're working with best in class operators. Here's a little tear sheet of some of the things that we've done. If it's a great way of starting with someone, actually, I have a resource if I can put it out there. Uh, it's called the commercialpitchbook.com. 
I think the biggest th issues new investors have is that they don't know how to wear the right clothes to the party. And I put together a pre-done pitch book that does anything income producing. So self-storage, multifamily, office, retail, whatever. But you, that's the first book that you show any investor who you're soliciting from. And they look at that. A lot of that are going to say, that's kind of professionally done. This guy knows what he's talking about, even though I put it together. And that's going to give them enough credibility to take home to read and really go over it. Because once you start talking to them about the self-directed IRA and the success other investors have had in real estate and, and why you like multifamily rather than, you know, buying like single family homes in impoverished areas of the country, you're actually, you know, you've actually been much more thoughtful about the approach to the investment rather than just being kind of desperate running out there. So that gives you the opportunity to sort of build the relationship by saying, look, I did my homework already. This is, you know, this is it. This is what we're looking at. Move your money over because when it's time to get called, it's going to get called. And I don't even want you talking if you're a new guy about anything. You should only be concerned with them moving money into a self-directed IRA. Be like, we have nothing yet. We have nothing yet. We have nothing yet. When I'm ready, we will. Okay. Because now this shows that you're exercising good decision-making and judgment. So that's, that's usually what, you know, the way we do that. Love it. I, I want to, get on the part where we're talking about the emails because one of the one of the things I know you have to share is talking a little bit about a red receipt. So with emails, most people when they, when I send you an email, most mm -hmm. of the time I have no idea if you opened it or not, but there yeah. is a way to figure that out. Yeah. So how do you do that so that you can see if they've opened it once, twice? three times or they've even opened it four times and not taken action. How do you find that out? We actually are switching over to a new program provider. Um, and there are ways of doing it where you can actually see who's opened it. What I like doing is I like being a lot more deliberate. Like if I send you an email, I'll put a read receipt on it. And if I don't hear from you, I'll forward you the read receipt and say, Hey, just wanted to follow up on this because it's not like, Oh, you know, like I read it and I didn't do anything. Read receipts are very important. Emails. Remember people are going to be going after that. What I would also do is I would make sure I would hyperlink a lot of things too, to see how many people have actually watched the video or have downloaded the tear sheet. That's going to be much more important, but it's the text messages that are going to be most effective here if you do it not acting like an idiot and being spammy but really being more direct and very very professional about it that's that's what i'm talking about now one of the things for people who are just getting started if you really want to get into this is that you could probably curate your own content or even post it on facebook and say see this is why i like multifamily. see housing's crashing you go on zero hedge you can find all the articles you need and just forward it on your book and say this is why we're going on multifamily because, you know, I, the things that I've been looking at in the market, this is what it is. And home repair equipment sales are down and that causes a problem. And, and people are like, wow, this guy's really smart. I always thought he was driving a lift for the rest of his life, but he knows what he's doing. That's going to give you, your investors, the conviction that, hey, you're a little more into this and you have a little more experience and you're a little more open-minded about what the, you know, why we're going into this rather than the other guy who can't really explain anything about the deal. And there's a lot of those guys running around. All right, let's skip ahead. Okay. All of the phenomenal things that I know that are in your head on, on sales and how to, how to give them fear of missing out and how to pre-qualify them and, and turn the tables. Mm -hmm. I want to know in the next couple of minutes to mm -hmm. just to understand what do you do after you've closed a deal? Yeah, that you have the closing dinner. This is culture. You, you know, you already have the toys, but what I like to do is I like to have a closing dinner. Closing dinners for us is usually, and again, you're billing your, you, again, you're banging your investors for this. So you're not coming out of pocket. If you know what I'm talking about, you know, it's sort of like the law firm, they'll take you out to dinner, but then on the bill, you'll see it's $2,000. Don't be egregious about it. But what I like doing is that we always have a closing dinner, especially if they're local. And I tell the investors to come in and I tell them to bring in any friends of theirs who may be interested as well. And if Fogo to Chow, what you could do is you could put together a great back room and it only costs, I think, $35 or $45 per plate, okay, which is cheap. But your people are getting what they consider to be or what they perceive to be much better meal than they actually are getting. <laughs> and for cheap, and you get to control the cost. And at that point, what you do is you give a slide presentation about all the other deals that are coming up and where you see the market going and all this kind of stuff. Because now you have a closed audience. Everybody's happy. Everybody's high-fiving. Everybody's drinking wine. They want to know what's next. And that's when you bring out the other stuff. Okay. So, so, well, so you're here at dinner. 
Yeah. You've taken to Fogo to Chow. It's 35 to 45 a person. You're controlling the costs. Mm. You mentioned that some of this, this cost might come out of closing or something. And the main purpose of this is to prepare them for future opportunities. No, you want to give them an experience like they've accomplished something that this is a bigger deal than pressing a buy button on E Trade. That they're more of it, that this is the air is much sweeter in commercial than anywhere else. You're giving them an experience, you're giving them something that elevates their status. And at the same time, while they're high on that and their endorphins are going, they want to know what else is going on. Love it. So, this is for all of the investors who invested in that deal. If Correct. I had. 50-ish investors invest in my next deal and they were in most of the 50 states, a little bit in Canada and Australia. Yeah. How many am I to expect to actually attend? Like 10 of them? I would say, uh, you know, we are, we've always had about 20 of them in Vegas because Vegas is very easy to get to. Our office is a class A office and there's a nice restaurant next door so when the you know people come in they do it you know we do a little talk and then we go to the vintner grill and then all that i would say expect 10 of them um if you don't have that many people coming exploit the ones who are coming and ask them if they have any wealthy friends who would understand this type of sophisticated investment i love the way that you worded that now we have the dinner mm -hmm. and they're coming in for the dinner and if they're flying in from another state are there any other things on the agenda besides the dinner no i mean i'm assuming that people mostly who are going to be coming are going to be mostly local people right what you're looking at is probably something that's going to be more of like a banquet which is like more of like a formal roadshow type of dinner where you might have to rent out like a lobby of a hotel and have it you know professionally catered if that's the case what you're doing i would say if you have a lot of investors coming in globally all over the world do what we do and just hold one event once a year where everybody does all the grandstanding and everybody can participate in one big old uh, closing dinner, you know, and, and that's the way I would do it. Unless you're doing, but you know, I, I, you're much more of a sophisticated global investor, but the people I'm talking to are probably people that they know through social circles, church, golf, otherwise that they know. Uh, and they're going to be a lot more nuclear to them rather than like you who has money from all over the place. Does that make sense? It does. Sal, I know that you are busy today. and know that you had a lot going on. Thank you for taking the time to come yes. on the show and add value to the audience. I really, truly appreciate it. Sure. Appreciate yes. How does the listener find you or get a hold of you? That's a good question. I would say if they want to get a hold of us, they should follow us on the Commercial Investor Facebook page. So that's facebook.com forward slash the Commercial Investor. And we're going to be reinvigorating our podcast uh, in the fall. We've just been ramping up with some staffing and stuff, but the deal business has taken a lot of time. But if you'd like to know anything about us and what we do, you could always go to thedanjuletter.com. And you, um, once you fill that out, then you can learn a little bit, you know, the letter. And I would really like you to take that letter. I hope it's the real estate one that's up there, but you could use it at your uh, will to use to piecemeal, to put on posts or emails to your investors so that you're attracting positive attention. And that's going to help you grease the shoot to get to the step one, which is all this and the IRAs and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely encourage the listener to go to dvdandrewletter.com. Thank you so much, Sal, for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm going to let you go, it's but until fun. next time, think Thank outside you. the box. As a reminder, any investment opportunities mentioned on this show are for accredited investors only. And if you're interested in working with me and my team, then go to realbluespruce.com and click get on the list. It's that simple. Just click get on the list to start passively investing. This has been an episode of the Apartment Investing Show with me, Adam Adams, all rights are reserved and if you haven't done so already then make sure that you absolutely smash that subscribe button and i'll see you on the next episode